Welcome to Cryptoland. I'm Krishna Andavolu, and today we're talking about how cryptocurrency has changed the game of cybercrime. Hackers and cyber gangs have been locking down the data of large corporations, police departments, and even hospitals, and demanding ransom. And guess what? They're asking for cryptocurrency. It's called ransomware, and it's a huge and expensive problem for all of us. We went to Missouri to see how one school district is dealing with this threat and how cybersecurity veterans are fighting these increasingly common attacks using the blockchain itself. Ransomware is an epidemic right now. The attack paralyzed computer networks at hundreds of businesses in the United States and more than 1,000 of them across the globe. It can be as simple as a link, an attachment. It really only takes one click. Ransomware attacks costing U.S. companies millions of dollars have tripled in the last year. It will lock down the computers either of an individual person or maybe the entire network of the company as well. Then they extort you, right, you know, to get that data back if you don't have a backup. And until you pay a ransom in Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, you can't use your computers. You have to presume that you won't really know the extent of what might have been compromised, and yet I think you should presume something has been compromised. You read about it, you see stories about it, you hear about it, but until it happens to you or to someone that's close to you, you just, it all seems somewhat unreal. On February 24th of 2021, our district was hit with a ransom attack that impacted all of our systems district-wide. Teachers and students throughout the Afton School District were forced into an emergency virtual learning today. That is after an unknown suspect compromised the security of their systems. That day, I woke up normal time. I, I usually do around six. Started my day with a cup of coffee, sat down to look at my phone. I noticed an email from one of our teachers that had a screenshot of a ransom note on his machine. So that was the trigger for me that you know, we had a potential major problem on our hands. Well, I'm usually one of the first to arrive. So I was here probably just after 6 a.m. I knew something was wrong right away because I can see the, uh, the screen that I use on the desktop and it was blue said some very rude things, of course, and I, I could realize right away that this was a problem. And then it became, you know, get to work as fast as possible, panicking the entire time I was driving into work. This was my first stop. You know, it was probably a little after seven by the time I got here. I'm all those pieces of software that we need to make the network function in the districts all live on these two guys. So they access this remotely, right? So over the internet to one of these servers. We decided to go ahead and, and call school off for the day, not have people show up. And because there were so many things that were unknown, we really weren't able to give a lot of definitive action other than we have a network outage or a district-wide network outage. We, we don't know what information has been taken. Um, here's the ransom note. So it's um, POSA, which is the group. Hi, company. company. Every, Every byte, byte on any types of your devices was, was encrypted. encrypted. Don't, don't try, try to use backups, backups because it were encrypted, encrypted too. To, to get all of your data back, back contact us. Also, also be aware that we downloaded, downloaded files from your servers, servers and in case of non-payment, We'll be forced to upload them on our website, and if necessary, we will sell them on the darknet. And then some FAQs, what to do to get all data back. Don't restart the computer, don't move files and write us. What to tell my boss, protect your system, amigo. And they were able to obtain about 26 megabytes of information. It was really files from our HR department, and they were primarily social security. In total, I think it was around a thousand different people that were impacted that we had to send a notice to. So the next week or two uh, after it happened, where it was it was pretty time consuming. Honestly, you're going to need to work with these cyber attorneys. You're going to need to work with this cyber forensics firm. Um, so then your scope of the amount of people that you need to contact it goes from everyone ever who had any sort of um, 
affiliation with the Afton School District to, okay, this is a very specific set of people that we're talking about. These cybersecurity experts, they will come in for a hefty fee and they will assess, well, this is what has been taken, this is what's locked down. Hopefully they'll actually help you kick them out. If you do decide to make that payment, um, that they are, you know, they're the ones that figure it all out, issue the payment and negotiate with the threat actors. Um, but in our case, you know, we didn't go that route. We immediately restarted things. Backups were not impacted, did not contact them whatsoever, never had any contact with them. And then, you know, started restoring from there. Having, having the information that was taken posted was, was huge in that because it, it made us realize what systems they did or didn't have access to. A huge sigh of relief when you realize that your student data and that your family data was, was something that you were able to protect. I'm Jackie Coven. I lead ransomware intelligence at Chanalysis. I've been hunting cyber threat actors on the blockchain for about three years now. 2020, we dubbed the year of ransomware. That said, 2021 is on pace to surpass 2020's totals. What we do at Chanalysis is we actually translate a transaction into the, the parties involved. And, and you can think of it as creating the phone book of the blockchain and, and de-anonymizing the parties involved in those transactions. Let me show you how it works. These circles are actually what we call clusters, but you can think of them as a, a wallet. In this case, we're seeing an exchange that is paying to NetWalker ransomware wallet. So this arrow signifies the direction and that the Bitcoin is being paid to NetWalker ransomware. And we can actually look inside NetWalker's wallet. And this particular wallet has received $56 million. NetWalker was responsible for over 300 ransomware attacks before it was taken down in January of 2021. What we can do, we can actually watch this cluster. We can actually get an email anytime funds go in or out of that wallet and get notified instantly. It's such a unique piece of intelligence that can be used whether you're responding to an incident and mapping it out, or whether you're trying to do more strategic intelligence, understanding how these networks are operate, how are they connected, and what are the centers of gravity for, for disruption? Ransomware is a billion dollar industry, and that's not hyperbole. You know, figures from the Department of Treasury just recently said it is literally billions of dollars going into this. There's PISA, Revil, DarkSide, some of them are gonna be tongue-in-cheek, sort of jokey, but it's to serve a point, which is that we have a brand and you're not gonna mess with us when you know who we are. So Klopp was one of these uh, ransomware groups that not only uh, locks down a victim's computers, but they also steal data with the threat of publishing it publicly uh, on the dark web. And law enforcement did target Klopp. Uh, it looks like it targeted somewhat low-level members of the organization, more the money side, at least from what we can see from the outside looking in. Fascinatingly, law enforcement will publish footage from their raids. They go in with their, with their weapons or whatever, and it's just some guys sat around <laughs> some small computers on their bed or whatever. There's a ton of computers on, on the left-hand side, some laptops over here. Ransomware has really changed now to these at-scale attacks. Now we're talking about, you know, organized crime rings essentially holding entire companies hostage. They are looking for serious paydays, whether that's millions or tens of millions. Revil is probably the most prolific ransomware group. They're behind some of the most high profile ransomware attacks of the last few months. When Darkseid targeted the Colonial Pipeline company and locked down computers, probably that for a lot of just ordinary Americans, the light bulb kind of switched on. It's like, oh, all of this hacking stuff, this can impact my life. Some gas stations reporting they have no gasoline to sell. In fact, this can impact whether I can, you know, potentially buy food for my family, whether I can get fuel for my car, whether I can actually get to work. This is real now for a lot of people. You will have these law enforcement operations. They may make a small dent in an organization's ranks or various tiers, but they come back often. You know, the cogs of ransomware just keep on going. 
actually measuring the impact of ransomware goes way beyond what is paid in cryptocurrency. We saw how quickly uh, the, the government spun up with the attack on Colonial. Imagine that scenario on a nuclear power plant. Imagine that in a defense facility or missile silo. It's the potential for even physical destruction of these facilities, which can snowball into a catastrophic event that we luckily haven't seen. And I do mean that we are lucky we haven't seen it. For years, Bitcoin and crime were inextricably linked through drug markets on the dark web. Now, even investment bros and big companies are getting into Bitcoin, but it's still widely used for good old-fashioned crime. Here to talk about the criminal underbelly of cryptocurrency are motherboards Joseph Cox and Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchiari, along with Runa Sandvik, a veteran of the security industry. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, I want to talk about ransomware, how cryptocurrency is kind of the secret sauce of it all, and where it's going, what we should be afraid of, and how to you know, get in front of it. But to do that, I think we have to take a trip back in time to the dark web, to how Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were the secret sauce of like Silk Road. So I want to ask you, Joseph, because I know you've done a lot of reporting about that stuff. Tell me about where Bitcoin and the criminal underbelly of the world first kind of emerged together. Yeah, so I mean, this really starts with Silk Road, which was a dark website you would log on to, you would look on its digital shelves, just like Amazon or eBay, and then you could order cocaine, heroin, MDMA, whatever you want. But the two key technologies were Tor, and a sort of an uh, anonymity network, which will let you browse the internet anonymously, but then also Bitcoin, which of course, you know, lets you to somewhat anonymously uh, trade money. The combination of those let people source these illegal goods, you know, essentially in the face of law enforcement. And it really showed, you know, well, maybe this cryptocurrency can be used for other criminal matters as well. I think before Bitcoin, you had, and, and this is still the case, that you have things like gift card, you have uh, PayPal equivalents, like you have other means of, of getting uh, payment. But Cryptocurrency definitely made it a whole lot easier for uh, criminals and everyone else, which then in turn made it harder for law enforcement to track and to figure out, like, where are these payments going? Who's owning the wallets? How do we regulate this? How do we prevent someone from sending money to uh, criminals, for example? Um, so it's, it's definitely been, been a good challenge. Because especially at the beginning, people had the impression that it was essentially completely anonymous. And now it's clear, you know, after 10, 10 years, you know, given all the people that have been arrested, you know, the Silk Road founder, but it still allows you to do a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to do with PayPal or a credit card. And as Joseph said, you know, you can do it almost completely anonymously if you are careful. So criminals were just like, all right, let's use it for, for ransom. I mean, it also lets criminals operate at a much larger scale than they would have done before. You know, if you go and hack a machine, or even if you just steal an item from somebody, you say, I'll give this back if you send me $100 over PayPal or something. Okay, maybe I have to do that. How about you send me $500,000 or 1.5 million over PayPal? I mean, that's just not gonna work. Cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin especially, allows you to operate at that sort of scale. And this is the scale that ransomware gangs are operating at. They are asking for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, per victim in you know, one single operation. Ransomware, and I don't know exactly when, but at some point it shifted from just being someone is coming and encrypting all of your data and saying, send me Bitcoin, uh, to now send me Bitcoin and I will unlock your files and I will not publish sensitive info on the internet. It just gives the victims this greater incentive to actually pay the ransom. Which is to say it's like not only ransom, but blackmail. Yeah, yeah double exactly. extortion. My sense is like, isn't Bitcoin like the ultimate marked bill? Like you know what it is because everyone knows what it is. If you try to cash that out somewhere, bing, like there it is we can catch the guy. But then like, how does that interact with the actual world of commerce and getting real cash that you can buy shit with? You know, if you can maybe get it 
uh, into a bank account which is not in your name and you can get somebody to then go and take the physical cash out, that might be a way to do it. Or you can find another way to transfer the cash. Uh, I mean, this is such a problem that you have US law enforcement agencies even pretending to be uh, people who will cash out Bitcoin for you. So of course, criminals go to them. They have a very large uh, suitcase of cash or whatever, the transaction goes over, and they can record that, well, this person's trying to get rid of a lot of uh, criminal proceeds. You know, it's such a tight bottleneck that that is where law enforcement agencies are going to gravitate towards, both in undercover operations, but also in tracking people uh, and transactions on the blockchain. Monero is a more privacy-focused uh, cryptocurrency. You know, without going into the technical aspects of it, it does try to avoid some of the tracing issues of uh, traditional Bitcoin. And you know, there are various other ones as well. Really the main issue about why I think these privacy coins haven't really taken off is because it's already hard enough for a ransomware victim to suddenly get $500,000 worth of Bitcoin. Getting hold of $500,000 of Monero is like even harder. You know, I don't even know how you would necessarily do that. You know? um, <laughs> so you're talking about like, I'm a hospital administrator from West Virginia or something, and I, all of a sudden all of my computer systems are frozen up. Uh, and they're like, hey, go get Monero. Right, well, like, what even the hell is that? What is that, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, the vast majority of people are not even going to know what that is. And in some of the ransomware notes, the hackers do kindly say, oh, don't worry if you don't know about Bitcoin. Uh, here's a link. You can follow these instructions. <laughs> you can go to this website and you can buy them. So, oh, th you know, thank you very much. That's, that's very kind. That's helping me out, yeah. yeah. Are we past the big wave to a point where we can take a bit of a deep breath because we got it figured out? Or are we still in this, in like the, the beginnings where this might get more common because of X, Y, or Z? That's my big question, I think. It is continually escalating, not only from the types of targets, like the colonial pipeline, but the ransomware gangs themselves, they're now going for companies that actually sell software to hundreds of thousands of other companies. So if they hack this one very juicy target, huh. they push the ransomware to hundreds of victims, wow. and then they can extort all of them one by one. The scale is just exponentially increasing. But this is a crazy lucrative business to the point where you have seen that clear pivot from more traditional cybercrime gangs to, well, let's just get into ransomware as well. So who are these people? Most of them are large organizations. You know, there's the people, the developers who write the malware and make sure that, you know, it's going to work, it's going to lock down the computer, it's going to be impossible to uh, unlock unless uh, the ransomware operators give them the keys. Then there's the people that actually send the malware out. You know, those may be not the same people that write the malware. Then there's the people that interact with the victims, because you know, once the victim gets ransomware, they get a note and say, and you know, the note, as Joseph said, may have some pretty detailed instructions on how to pay, because you know, these guys also want to get paid as soon as possible, yeah. as quick as possible. So there's so some customer service involved. There's customer service, yeah. <laughs> there's like a chat where victims can say, hey, you know, uh, we got our computers locked, please give us our files back. So those people are like completely different and they may not even know who they're working for. You know, there must, there, most of the time there's like layers of anonymity between the uh, different uh, parts of the organization. Then there's the people that cash out the Bitcoin. There's also a new kind or newish kind of ransomware, which is called ransomware as a service. So there's like gangs that all they do is write the malware, the mm -hmm. ransomware. They don't even do, they don't even hack people. There's just like, and they sell it as a subscription model. So like they advertise this malware out and say, hey, if you use it and you hit victims with Wait, this. Wait, where do they advertise it? like dark web or websites like that, chat, chat groups, um, underground chat groups. And in but, but what I'm hearing from you is that there's like an ecosystem of commerce around this very phenomenon, and it's only getting bigger. Especially if, like because of this subscription model, this ransomware as a service, you don't even need to know how to write malware. Mm. You can just take somebody else's malware, infect victims, and then pay the, the creators like 10%, 5%, whatever it is. You can freelance on this marketplace, and people buy your product. Yeah, I mean, beyond the subscription model, we also have these people who are called affiliates, which are the ones who will actually go in and break into the target, which is a completely different skill set, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're not necessarily the ones making the malware. It does sound like organized crime with money trickling to the top. I mean, if I'm like the Sinaloa cartel, I might be like, hey, let's get in the game on this, right? Like, is it going to the point of transnational crime where it's up there with the other big transnational crimes that we talk about all the time? We haven't seen it that much yet, um, but we're starting to see it. Like earlier this year, we reported that 
the Italian mafia was using hackers to launder money and just make some money on the side. Uh, it's just too good of a business for organized crime not to get into because it's also safer. You know, you don't need to point your gun at anyone. You don't need to kill anyone. My uncle, who's really into Bitcoin these days, would say, no, it's not made for crime. It's made for uh, a new dawn of thinking about currencies not as a fiat you know, thing that governments that are sovereign do, but a way for us as peer-to-peer is to, to, to really think about what value is. And, and we, we can be the ones who like determine our future, not governments. Like, yeah, how many people actually use Bitcoin without going through an exchange, which is essentially like a bank or like a stock market or whatever you want, like a financial institution? You know, they are on Coinbase, they're on Gemini, they're on these companies that are essentially, they, cent- they centralize Bitcoin, they centralize cryptocurrency. So we're back, it's the same financial system. It's starting to be just as regulated as the old financial system. And it's just not, it's not libertarian, it's not a libertarian dream anymore. It's just not practical as a means of payment. It's only like, gold, you know, like you can use it for specu- to speculate, hoping that it will go up. Or you can use it to pay criminals. So Bitcoin is basically money for criminals. I mean, I, I do think that like we, we could have had a discussion about uh, the ways in which that uh, cryptocurrency is used for good. So like back in the day, we had this whole debate about uh, Tor allows bad people to do bad things on the dark web. We then also focused on what are good ways that you can use Tor, and now that discussion is a bit more balanced than it was back then. I think now, yes, ransomware is definitely a big problem. It is something that we need to figure out how to how to solve or how to mitigate. Um, and I do think that that uh, going after how they're making money is, is sort of one one part of that puzzle. Uh, but like we could have had a whole debate about how cryptocurrency is actually supporting uh, content creators and sex workers and people who do business, which uh, we might consider legitimate business, but that the visas and MasterCards and PayPal's of the world would disagree with. Do you think that companies are taking ransomware for the threat that it is? Do you think they're actually responding as one would, like when you think about how easy it could be for any given company to be ransomware? No, I don't. I think that in in many ways, ransomware is still seen as a cybersecurity problem that the cybersecurity people uh, can and should fix. Uh, And it's not seen as something that would impact um, corporate communications. It might impact HR. It might impact the legal department, finance, the individual who deals with insurance. Just think about um, if you get hit with ransomware and PII is taken, depending on the state or the country, you may then be required to notify a governing body about the fact that this data has not been taken. Um, that is a much larger problem that goes way beyond just what the security team is working on. But I don't think that a lot of companies have really thought about it in that way and just thought about the number of resources that they would have to put in to um, respond to that type of incidents. I recently read a a book called uh, The Skies Belong to Us about how airplane hijackings used to be very, very common because it was super easy to just like board a plane, no ID, cash in hand, sit down, plane gets up in the air and you're like, hey, I wanna take over the cockpit and we're gonna go to Cuba. And uh, hijackings today, much, much harder because we put in place a bunch of different safety measures along the way and we've learned from the past. And I think that that's where we are with cryptocurrency now, we're sort of seeing how easy it is to use for this type of crime. We're seeing this being leveraged in that way. Then the question just becomes, how can we, can we regulate it in some way? Can we shut it down entirely? Do we want to do that? Um, I think we're definitely seeing it at the scale it is today because it is easy. And so the question is, how can we make it harder? Well, thank you guys. I hope we do make it harder because I'm scared. That's it for us today. We'll see you next time.